Well, dear brethren, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is behind us, and at the end of the last weekly Sabbath, which fell within the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we began counting the days toward the Day of First Fruits, commonly known as Pentecost. Now, that milestone event in human history, when the power of the Holy Spirit was made available to those who will repent and be baptized, is recorded in the Book of Acts. Now, the Book of Acts is a record of the first original church in the first century, and we are a continua we are a continuation of that church. And because the Book of Acts is its history, my desire is to cover with you the Book of Acts as we approach the Feast of First Fruits. However, do you know, brethren, that the first Roman Pope, the founder of the Roman Catholic Church, is recorded in the Book of Acts. It is the only place in the Bible where he is mentioned and we find no more records of him in the Scriptures. In Acts chapter 8, verse 4 through 8, we read that Deacon Philip went to the capital of Samaria and preached the Messiah and the gospel of the kingdom of God. And his preaching was followed by miracles. Various people were healed and evil spirits were cast out of many. And then starting in verse 9, we are informed about a famous man from Samaria who even got baptized. Acts chapter 8 and verse 9. We'll read all the way through verse six, uh, 13 because it just gives us uh, a good and detailed approach and uh, information, detailed information about this man. There was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city. The city was the capital of Samaria and astonished the people of Samaria claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah in other words, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Well, brethren, it is important for us that we understand several facts from this account about Simon the Samaritan. Now, Simon was a Samaritan, not a Jew. This is important because Samaritans invented their own religion and their own Pentateuch, claiming themselves to be the chosen people, not the Jews. So they basically invented their all five books of the law, and they claimed that the books pointed out to them as the chosen people. Of course, in denying, they were denying the Jewish people, their neighbors, southern neighbors, the title of the chosen people. However, when you read the account of Jesus Christ and his encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well, in John chapter 4 and verse 22, the Messiah, brethren, tells us clearly that salvation was of the Jews, not of the Samaritans. This is important because, as you can see in this passage, Samaritans basically had their false messiah, Simon the sorcerer. And also please note that the Bible says that salvation was of the Jews. It doesn't say that it is for the Jews. The salvation is for the Jews as well as for all other peoples. But it came, of course, of the Jews because our messiah was of the Jewish nationality. He was born in the Jewish culture, observed all the laws that were Torah based and that our that his kinsmen also observed even though they had many other added religious practices and he didn't by the way he didn't join any sect of his time he didn't join Pharisees nor Sadducees nor uh, essence nobody else he just came was born in the flesh and began to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and then of course his own church was founded on the day of Pentecost, the day of first fruits, on in 31 AD. So anyway, the first point that I wanted to draw to you is that the salvation is, was of the Jews, not of Samaritans. We also have read in this passage that Simon Magus used demonic powers to deceive the Samaritans with both with his magic, with his both miracles and wonders that he performed by witchcraft and magic. And thus the whole population of Samaria as it says, both small and great, looked on him as the greatest prophet. And brethren, all Samaritans believed in him, 
That's why he was so astonished when Philip came and preached the gospel of kingdom and many people turned away from him because all Samaritans believed in him and they worshipped him as the great one, as it says. <coughs> Actually, they worshipped him as a god because we read, they said, this man is that is that power of God called great, that is the almighty. So he was called the almighty God, brethren. They called him God in the flesh. Now, Simon nominally became a Christian. We read that Simon himself believed and was baptized. Well, that is, he outwardly entered, under quotation mark, entered the Christian church. Nobody can enter the Christian church unless God adds him or her to the body of Christ. And yes, people can even get baptized outwardly and yet only get wet and nothing more. This is the case with Simon Magus. Simon Magus even recognized that Christ's power was greater than his but wanted to be associated with that great name. Mark what I said, the name, brethren. Because the religion which he invented later only had the name of Christ upon it. Everything else in that religion, the substance, the rituals, the customs, were having nothing to do with Jesus Christ at all, nor with the apostolic, apostolic customs and apostolic religion. So seeing so many who now believed in the name of Christ, Simon Magus realized a great potential that Christianity had. And obviously he saw it as an opportunity for a personal gain, as we read later in the chapter. Now the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria received the word of God, so they sent Simon Peter, the apostle Simon Peter, and the apostle John to them to lay hands on the newly baptized so that they would receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So they were only immersed into the water in the name of Jesus Christ and their sins were now cleansed and now into their cleansed you know into their cleansed state spiritual state they could now receive the Holy Spirit so by laying on of hands and so we read now that Simon of Samaria was a witness to that verse 18 Acts chapter 8 verse 18 and 19 and when Simon saw that through the laying of the apostles hands the Holy Spirit was given he offered them money saying, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, brethren, so obviously Simon Magus was thinking of a great prestige that the office of an apostle would give him. After all, he was already established in Samaria and was revered by all the Samaritans, right? By all his kinsmen. He was their God in the flesh, their Messiah. So it was logical to Simon that he would become an apostle to Samaritans. Yes, brethren, it was logical to his carnal mind, which obviously never experienced true repentance. We talked a lot about repentance in the last weeks, brethren, didn't we? From what we read about Simon of Samaria, it seems that he didn't even repent of what he had, of what even he had done, let alone of what he was. The apostle Peter immediately perceived his intention. It wasn't that Simon wanted to buy the Holy Spirit alone, Oh no, brethren, his main goal was to become an apostle. Verse 21, Peter responded to him, You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Now the King James Version says, You have neither part nor lot in this matter, which is a very good translation because the true apostles, as you probably remember, had been chosen after Christ's death to take part in the apostleship by lot. We, you find that account in Acts, book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 25 and 26. So Peter was telling Simon he couldn't buy an apostleship. It wasn't something to be bought. It's not something to be purchased. God is the one who appoints the apostles. God is the one who appoints all those people who are part of his government in his church. In his church. And then in the next verse, Simon Peter told Simon of Samaria to repent, even though he clearly knew that this magician of Samaria would not repent. You can see that in clearly in the original Greek language. However, then in verse 23, we read one of the most important brethren prophecies we have in the Bible. Now mark well what I said. One of the most important prophecies, brethren, prophecies. Good News Bible says... For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. The King James Version says, For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness 
and in the bond of iniquity or bond of lawlessness brethren so rendering of this verse 23 in our languages all our languages french uh, serbian english the renderings of this verse in our languages do not spanish do not give us the full force of peter's accusation of simon magus brethren the essence of verse 23 is that peter knew the mind of this man and what this man was to become now we understand that from a commentary of william ramsey in his pictures of the apostolic church page 60 ramsey says peter rebuked him in strong and prophetic terms the prophecy is concealed in the ordinary translation the greek means thou art for a gall of bitterness and a fetter of unrighteousness or lawlessness in effect, a cause of bitterness and corruption to others. End of the quote. So, brethren, this was a prophecy. Now, what does that prophecy actually tell us? It tells us that, you know, what Simon the sorcerer of Samaria was to become. Longest Commentary, Volume 9, page 148, explains this. He says, Peter's words literally mean, I regard you as a man whose influence will be like that of bitter gall, poison, and a bond of unrighteousness, or lawlessness, or as a man who has reached such a state. End of the quote. In other words, Simon of Samaria was prophesied to be the adversary of original church or in the future. And this prophecy, brethren, is the key for us to understand the rest of the New Testament as far as the origins of the heresies mentioned in the letters of the Apostles are concerned. Because there is hardly any letter of the Apostle, hardly any epistle of the Apostles that does not mention basically the religious system of Simon Magus, which is called Gnosticism, which we already gave, I gave you a good message about Gnosticism, and we, we basically touched upon several scriptures that defy the Gnostic teachings of Simon Magus. And one of these days, yes, certainly we'll just go through all the New Testament scriptures that today's churchianity twists to their own destruction. And it's all the consequence of the of the teachings of the father of Gnosticism, or the father of all heresies, as he's known, which is the first Roman, who is the first Roman Pope, and that is Simon Magus. So he was prophesied to be the adversary of the original apostolic church in the future, which means we are the continuation of that church from the future. That means that the teachings and the followers of Simon Magus are well and alive and kicking even today, giving the challenges and troubles to us today, brethren. And the chief heretic, Simon of Samaria, the father of Gnosticism originated the Gnostic doctrinal heresies that had crept into the original Church of God and subverted it from within. Now the Apostle Peter, brethren, said that Simon was to become a gall of bitterness. Well, in the Jewish world of that time, it was a figure of speech adopted from the Old Testament, which denoted going over to the idols and abominations of the heathen. Let us go to Deuteronomy chapter 29. There in Deuteronomy 29, this figure of speech is plainly used. Deuteronomy 29, verse 16. Moses writes to Israelites, For you know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the nations which ye passed by. And you have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them, lest there should be any you, man or woman or family or tribe, whose heart turns away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that bears gall and wormwood. A root that bears gall and wormwood. So when the Apostle Peter applied to Simon Magus the phrase gall of bitterness, he meant that Simon would be the one responsible for the introduction of heathen beliefs and idols into true Christianity. 
That is why, brethren, later Jude writes in his epistle, verse 4, about the very men who followed Simon Magus, including Simon Magus himself. It's a very famous verse, which I'm sure you know, which says, For there are certain men, crept in unawares, who are before of old ordained to this condemnation. So Peter recognized that Satan was going to use Simon Magus as the great protagonist of false Christianity that will take over the true church of God. Not only does the book of Acts, brethren, show the beginnings of the true church, but it equally reveals the origin of the false church masquerading as Christianity. Now, Simon of Samaria never repented of his doctrinal error and his demonic magic. He was raised in Samaria where he came to be celebrated as God in the flesh. Now, what did Simon and the Samaritans believe? Well, the Babylonian religion had come especially to Samaria. The Samaritans were largely Babylonian by race, brethren. In 2 Kings chapter 17 and in verse 24, it tells us that most of the Samaritans had been taken to Samaria from Babylon and adjacent areas and they replaced the exiled ten tribes of Israel. They adopted the idea of being chosen people, but they brought their religion with them. And their religion was nothing more than the outright paganism under the guise of Yahweh or Jehovah worship. Now, brethren, as the history shows us, there were originally five Babylonian tribes who had been transported to the area where the ten tribes of Israel once lived before they were defeated and captured by the Assyrians. And those five tribes brought their Babylonian and Assyrian gods with them. They took upon themselves the name the people of Yahweh or people of Jehovah, but their religion was a mixture of Israelitish calf worship and Babylonianism, just as Simon Magus later appropriated Christ's name but continued his pagan abominations. So that final religious state of Samaritans is described in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 41. The entire chapter 17, or a good portion of chapter 17, speaks about the Samaritans, their religion, and how they replace the ten tribes of Israel in the land, in the promised land. Verse 41, chapter 17 of 2 Kings. So these nations, those five nations, feared the Lord. How did they fear the Lord? Well, by calling themselves God's people, and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, who are their fathers, the Babylonians, brethren. So they do they unto they do so do they unto this day. So they did it, brethren, anciently before Christ. And even unto this day, to our day, their followers, their descendants, their children of their children continue their spiritual children of their children continue exactly in the same manner. They serve their graven images, but they call themselves people of God. They call themselves true church. They believe that God is working through their churches to save the world. And they have graven images, or in some cases, they worship their pastors and uh, preachers. They worship material things. But those who have graven images, of course, as you know, are the European churches, the Roman church in the West, and their sister church, the Orthodox church in the East. So anyway, the Samaritans, who populated the northern part of the Promised Land, where formerly the ten tribes of Israel lived, they called themselves the worshippers of the true God, but were actually Babylonian idolaters. So Simon Magus grew up in this mixed-up society. The Samaritans called themselves the people of the true God, but religiously they were practicing Babylonians. And Simon himself was a priest of these people because the word Magus, by which he's known even in English language, the word Magus is the Babylonian Persian word, which means priest. So basically he was the high priest of the Samaritans. And thus, in that encounter of Peter and John with Simon Magus, we find the first real connection of true Christianity with the Chaldean priest or Babylonian priest who was prophesied to bring in its false counterpart. So he was the originator of the false counterpart religion, which became pandan to the true Christianity. 
And I mentioned John, and I'll mention him in the passing coming today as well, brethren, because I told you that John was the one who wrote his, uh, his gospel, the last of all the four gospel authors. He wrote his gospel toward the end of the first century as well as his epistles. By that time, he could see the effects of the Babylonian religion propagated by Simon Magus. He was a witness how that religion crept in to the true church and was subverting and destroying the church from within. So interestingly that even in Samaria, along with Peter, he was the one who, who met and encountered the uh, one who originated that system. Interestingly enough, also there are good commentaries which say that whoever is mentioned in the Bible is not there mentioned for no reason. As I mentioned to you many times, the account of Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman is mentioned only in the Gospel of John. And uh, since this woman is mentioned, there is a good reason to believe that she was actually, she lived with Simon the sorcerer, Simon Magus. And that she would, you know, she was sort of witness to him as well. And even that whole town for which she was believed on Jesus Christ, which would be even greater witness to Simon Magus. So though that's what the commentaries say. And yes, it's, it's a good reason to believe that. Interestingly, also enough, Jesus Christ tells her about her five husbands you have five husbands and even the one with whom you live now is not your husband well brethren those were originally five babylonian tribes who populated samaria and they brought with themselves their various five pagan cults so and a woman as you know is a symbol in the bible is a symbol of the church so therefore she was a symbol with those five husbands of you know a church, pagan church, fornicating with, you know, in this case, five husbands, in the case of Samaritans, with five major horrible pagan cults. So whatever is written in the Bible is there for a reason, brethren. Which, of course, as we dig in and dig out and uh, continue digging, we just discover more and more. And sometimes we are just amazed at how little do we know about the Bible. How little do we understand even the New Testament? So we better need to understand some historical context and sometimes even cultural context of some things so that we could understand why and for what reasons some things are written to us in the Bible. So Simon Magus wouldn't be mentioned there by, you know, by a chance. Yes, as the history tells us, he later moved to Rome. And what do you think that he was doing in Rome? Well, of course, he was mesmerizing the Romans with his religion to the point that they deified him and then as the uh, as the account will tell us supposedly uh, you know supposedly the Apostle Peter was buried on the Vatican Hill in a pagan cemetery which is totally ludicrous because the Apostle Peter brethren as we'll see in a minute in Galatians was the Apostle to the not to the heathens to the Gentiles and Rome has always been a Gentile city he was the Apostle to to the Jews, to those of circumcision. And by the way, the Jews were commanded, and even to this day, there is a practice that the Jews are buried in their own cemeteries. The Apostle Peter was an avid preacher against paganism and Roman church, and against Roman paganism, so why would you think that they would ever bury him, a Jew, in a pagan cemetery? No way. And plus, let me just tell you this much as well. Perhaps I'm running ahead of myself a bit, but why not? The claim that the remains of, of the Apostle Peter are there under the main altar in the so-called Saint Basilica in Rome are totally false, brethren. Are totally false because, according to the British historian Bede, and I'm thankful to those of you who allowed us to get that book here for our Bible, The Hope of Israel, the historian Bedet says that in the 6th century, Pope Vitalian sent the remains of Peter, Paul and several other martyrs to the English king Oswy. And Bede says that it is, and some, somebody else checked on that, and somebody says that the inventory of the Anglican Church in Canterbury contains this written message from the Pope Vitalian to the English King Oswy, mentioning to him, you know, in a very nice way, because King Oswy 
of England wanted to become a good Catholic, so he was asking the Pope to send some Catholic preachers to teach them how to keep Easter and how to keep Catholic customs. And out of dearness, this Pope sent him the remains of several martyrs. And on the list of those martyrs are Peter and Paul as well. Paul was beheaded in Rome in 67 AD. Peter was beheaded not in Rome, but his remains obviously were being taken to Rome. And then, then as we see, they were later transported to the British Isles. And I wasn't lazy, so several years ago, it was year 2013, I sent a message to the uh, archive of the Anglican Church and asked them, is it true that in your inventory you've got this note? A week later, it was, I remember, Friday afternoon toward the Sabbath, I got a very nice reply from Cressida Williams. She informed me that, yes, it's true, we have it in our inventory. And it's true that our church here is called the Church of St. Peter and Paul. However, we do not have any remains of those, of those two, she said, because King Oswy was in the northern part of England, so obviously those remains arrived here, they were recorded in the church, and then they were sent up north to the king, English King Oswy. So basically, you know, the remains of where Paul and Peter are, we don't really know. They're buried somewhere on the British Isles. Interestingly, in the land of lost Israel. <laughs> and no wonder, because according to the Greek, Greek historia metaphrast, both Paul and Peter preached mightily on the British Isles, and many people were converted as a result of their preaching. So this is all, you know, just to t tell you how ludicrous and unfounded is the claim that their remains of of the Apostle Peter under the main altar in Vatican. Well, certainly not. But you know, that pagan cemetery upon which the so-called St. Peter's Basilica is built was the place where the most outstanding magicians, occultists and uh, uh, religious figures of Rome were buried. Well, who do you think that was buried there in the most renowned pagan cemetery in Rome? Well, certainly not Simon Peter, certainly Simon the Sorcerer, Simon the, the, the Patre, Padre, pa, Padre, Father, the Pope, the first Pope. So those remains there, brethren, under the main altar of St. Peter's Basilica, which would be better probably named unholy <laughs> unholy Simon Sorcerer Basilica the remains are there of Simon Magus certainly not of Simon Peter Christ's Apostle anyway back to Samaritans now from which sprang Simon Magus so he grew up in that mixed up society the Samaritans called themselves the people of the true God but religiously they were practicing Babylonians and Simon himself was Magus, Magus, the priest of these people. And thus, you know, basically in the encounter of Peter with Simon Magus, we find the first real connection of true Christianity with the Babylonian priest who was prophesied to bring in its false counterpart, its falsified Christianity, brethren. All this Christianity that is surrounding us is a falsification. It's a falsification, falsified Christianity. We are informed by Justin Martyr. And I think Justin Martyr was, was an acquaintance or follower perhaps of, uh, of the Church of Smyrna. I, I, cannot, I think there are some uh, indications that he was keeping at least some of the Ten Commandments or was somewhat acquainted with the true church. But anyway, he was one of those church historians, one of those early church historians. Interestingly, enough he was a samaritan he was from samaria so he was well acquainted with samaria samaritan samarian religion so he wrote that simon magus moved to rome now justin martin also later moved to rome and wrote a whole apology to the roman people and he complained about simon magus being worshipped so uh, justin martin writes that simon magus went moved to rome and was only there as a great god. In his apology, he writes that the sect, that was the apology to Roman people and the Roman emperor, he writes that the sect of the Simonians 
He is formidable and he speaks four times of their founder si Simon. And no wonder that Simon from the book of Acts, because he states that that Simon was a Samaritan, that his birthplace was a village called Gitta, G-I-T-T-A, and was a, as a formidable, formidable magician who came to Rome in the days of Claudius Caesar, which was 45 AD, and made such an impression by his magical powers that he was honored as a god a statue being erected to him on the Tiber, River Tiber, between the two bridges, bearing the inscription in Latin, Simone Deo Sancto, in effect, the Holy God Simon. We read these things from Justin Martin, and they're quoted also in Dictionary of Christian Bi Bi Biography, Volume 4, page 682, and you can certainly find the writings of Justin Martin even online. You can find it online, then you can type the keyword Simon Magus, and then you'll find all the information he writes about Simon Magus, brethren. That's how information today are very available to all of us, and uh, as far as at least the true history of the true church is concerned, we don't really have much excuse if we don't learn about that in the process of our Christian growth. So, brethren, it was Simon Magus, not Simon Peter, the Apostle of Christ, who moved to Rome and founded the Roman Universal Church. The word Catholic meaning universal. And there are various proofs about that from the Bible itself. And we can get into those at some other point. I can give you 10 proofs that Simon Peter, the Apostle of Christ, never went to Rome. After all, brethren, who wrote the Epistle to, Rome? Who wrote the epistle to Romans? It was the Apostle Paul. Does Paul mention anybody in chapter 16 of that epistle? Does he mention anyone by name of Peter? No, not at all. And as one of our Serbian members pointed out this afternoon, oh, a, a fisherman from the Galilee would go to Rome, supposedly speaking Latin language. An, an, an ordinary fisherman of Jewish origin who had no connection with the Latin world, supposedly went to Rome and what? He preached the good news in what? In Latin? Certainly not, brethren. We know that of all the apostles, the apostle Paul was the one who was the most and the best educated man. That's probably why God chose him to be the apostle to the Gentiles, because he both speak Latin and Greek and being of the Israelite origin of the tribe of Benjamin, of the Jewish faith he would speak hebrew as well probably aramaic as well so the apostle paul was the one who was chosen not a fisherman from the galilee peter so there are various proofs that from the bible we can get other points but i'll just suffice to say now that in galatians chapter 2 verse 7 and 8 we read paul's statement paul says the gospel of the circumcision was unto peter for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles, toward the non-Jews. The Roman church was a Gentile church. The Ro Rome, the city of Rome, has always been, and in the back in those days was a Gentile, purely Gentile city, brethren. It was the seat of all paganism of the world. All the pagan cults from May Asia Minor who fled persecution. Uh, or, or any other trouble found their home in Rome. Rome became the home to, of all paganism. What a wonderful good place for a pagan magician Simon Magus to find his new home and then to blend all those religions into one universal religion, universal church with the name of Christ, Christian Universal Church. Amazing, brethren. What is the successor of Simon Meg is doing today well exactly the same he's bringing together all religions ecumenism the new trend in religious world all the religions are coming under one leadership all that you can do is just you know google out enter some keywords into the search engine or on YouTube you'll have the documentary programs so all of that is available to us, and we are witnessing to that, the history is repeating itself. 
So it was Paul, brethren, not Peter, who was commissioned to be the chief apostle to the Gentiles. And who was it that wrote the epistle to Romans again? Well, it was Paul, of course, because Rome was a Gentile city. It was never a city of circumcision or a Jewish city. And Paul further mentioned his special office as, uh, as the Gentile apostle in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. When he says to Timothy, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Brethren, Peter is nowhere in the Bible called the Apostle to the Gentiles. And this precludes him from going to Rome to become the head of a Gentile community. Even that is good enough proof, let alone various others. Where was Peter, you may ask? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, here is one of those confusing verses, one of those difficult to understand scriptures. Because he sends greetings from Babylon. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, brethren. And it was about 66 AD when he wrote that. So we find him in the city of Babylon among the Jews. Oh, you are now confused. How, how come among the Jews? Well, brethren, yes, the, Babylon, the name Babylon is related to the city on seven hills. And to the church that is on seven hills, which is Rome, Roman church. However, however... Rome today, the Roman church today, they are spiritual Babylon. Because they follow exactly spiritually all the customs and rites and, uh, and rituals of the Babylonian uh, religion. However, there was a province called Babylon, brethren. Province called Babylon and there was a sizable Jewish diaspora which lived in Babylon. So why was Peter in Babylon? Well, he wasn't in the Rome, as many would say, he wrote, was writing from Rome, and therefore, because Rome is Babylon. Rome is spiritual Babylon, but the literal Babylon existed. And history shows that there were as many Jews in the Mesopotamian area in Christ's time as there were in the Promised Land. So a huge Jewish diaspora was present in Babylon, in Mesopotamia, in the East, brethren, not in the West. And it is no wonder that we find Peter in the East. And that's the reason, perhaps, why the scholars say that Peter's writings are strongly Aramaic in flavor because the type of Aramaic was spoken in Babylon among the Jewish diaspora. And Peter was used to their Eastern dialect, of course. So at the times the Catholics believed Peter was in Rome, the Bible clearly shows that he was elsewhere, brethren. And by paying attention to God's own words, we will never be deceived. Peter was never the Bishop of Rome. Never. There is hardly any epistle that does not mention the religion of Simon Magus. Famous Philip Schaff, in his History of the Church, says the following about Simon Magus and his doctrines. The quote, Plain traces of this error appear in the latter epistles of Paul to the Colossians, to Timothy and to Titus, the second epistle of Peter, the first two epistles of John, the epistle of Jude, and the messages of the Apocalypse to the seven churches now in due course brethren we will indeed cover all those verses in the new testament that address the heresies of simon magus however as i often point out to you the apostle who makes the most deliberate and planned attack on the false christianity of simon magus is the apostle john and i've already mentioned to you on numerous occasions that john's gospel has an entirely different approach to the subject of christ's ministry than the other three. Unlike other gospel writers and unlike the epistles of Paul, John's writings came toward the end of the first century and times had changed. John was a witness to the fact that the teachings of, of Christ were being corrupted by Simon Magus' plot to destroy the truth. We probably notice, Bremlin, I hope you notice when you read John, John constantly underlines the necessity of keeping the commandments of God. Why? Well, because the false system was preaching liberal doctrines. John is the only gospel writer who mentions Christ's meeting with the woman of Samaria. All the other gospels mention Samaria about five times, and even then only in order to give us a simple geographical indication. 
Yet John devotes more space to matters in Samaria than is done in all the rest of the New Testament put together. So John, you see, tied up the gospel accounts of Christ and gave the church a well-rounded gospel, bringing in the extra points which were necessary for our knowing. That's why so many times you'll hear me pointing out the Apostle John and his writings, brethren. Because he gave us a well-rounded gospel and he was a witness of the accelerating apostasy taking place by the end of the first century in the original true church. And the leaders of that apostasy were the preachers of Simon Magus, Samaritans. And John's epistles, when we read them, they're packed with specific information regarding the conspiracy to overthrow the truth. And his last witness to God's truth before his death was the book of Revelation. Yes, it's a book of Jesus Christ, Revelation from Jesus Christ, but it was given to John to write it for us. Christ gave his <coughs> last written message of warning of this system through John in Revelation. So no wonder that the book of Revelation is very interesting. Because Christ tells us in the book of Revelation the very names of the system to watch in a hidden way. Well, brethren, why is it hidden? Because, of course, Revelation was the letter to the seven churches, which represent also the seven successive church eras through the centuries. If John wrote in a clear message such as the Church of Rome, Romans, Samaritans, Simon Magus, the censorship would destroy his letter and it would not be delivered to the seven churches. So that's why he writes in hidden language, which his readers would understand and could understand. And thanks be to the Eternal, in this last end time day, days and times, we are also able to understand and decipher the book of Revelation and to understand it completely. And now that we mentioned Simon Magus, brethren, from this point on, I'm sure that you will understand the book of Revelation much better than ever before. Because the book of Acts describes the, uh, the beginning of the false system. Then the epistles nail down its doctrines and describe its activities. And then comes the book of Revelation with, with, with showing us the false system's prophetic history through all eras of the church. As it says at the beginning of that book, it intends to show us things which shall be hereafter. So Christ tells us in Revelation... That the people who will represent this false system in all ages would be Samaritans, alias Christians, or plainly the followers of Simon Magus. In fact, brethren, our Savior gives us double witness of this identification. In the book of Acts, he tells us of Simon Magus being the beginning of the diabolical scheme. And then he reinforces it by telling us in Revelation that Simon's followers will make up the false system until Christ returns to this earth. Which means that even to, to, this time, to this day and age, there are followers of Simon Magus, brethren, spiritual followers of his, who are giving challenges, organizing persecutions, spreading rumors and lies about the true followers of Jesus Christ. Now Christ identifies the people behind the false system with several names. But these are simply different names of the same system. In two distinct ages of the church, we read these of these people with a distinct description. Revelation 3, 9, letter to Philadelphia. Christ says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, but are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. This is a promise. For us today in the remnant of the Philadelphia Church or in a remnant of the Philadelphia Church better to say. We also read of these false people called by this same name afflicting the Christians of the Smyrna Church era in Revelation chapter 2 verse 9. So we have those who claim that they are Jews but they are liars. Well brethren the identification repeated twice. And both are describing conditions hundreds of years apart. 
Who are those who claim to be Jews but lie? They are, make no mistake, brethren, they are Samaritan Christians, the followers of Simon Magus, the Samaritan. The Samaritans were the only people in the world in the first and second centuries who said they were Jews and yet were not Jews and they knew it. They knew it. Remember that account again of Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. She was amazed that he, a Jew, would talk to her. Because the Jewish people had nothing to do with those imposters. So they lied. Josephus, the famous historian, said at the end of the first century, just about the time John wrote Revelation, here is a quote from Antiquities of Josephus, book 11, chapter 8, line or paragraph 6. He says, when the Jews are in adversity, they, the Samaritans, deny that they are kin to them, and they then they confess the truth but when they perceive that some good fortune has befallen them they immediately pretend to have commune with them saying that they belong to them and desire their and desire their genealogy from the posterity of joseph ephraim and manasseh so brethren the samaritans well just like simon magus if to their advantage call themselves jews but they were liars they knew better. Their own records showed they came from Babylon and adjacent areas. And this is exactly what the Old Testament says. I told you in 2 Kings chapter 17, you can read about that, brethren. So they were clearly Gentiles. And the Jews, as I said, never had any real association with these Babylonian imposters. Even when Christ discussed matters with the Samaritan woman at the well, she acknowledged with amazement because a Jew talked with her that... The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. That's written in John chapter 4, verse 9. But even though the Samaritans were Gentiles, they consistently lied about their origin when it was profitable to them. So notice that the woman at the well, brethren, carried on the fiction of kinship with the Jews. When she said in verse 12 of John chapter 4, she said, Are thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well? Our father Jacob, brethren, they claim to be a type of Jew, but they were liars. And this is made plain by Christ himself when he first sent forth the twelve apostles in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. And this is the commission he gave them, Matthew 10, verse 5. Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter you not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jews also belong to the house of Israel. So the apostles were to go to the Jews and Israel, but not to the Gentiles or Samaritans. The Samaritans were plainly Gentiles, not Jews. They were liars. So, what is the synagogue of Satan then? Well, the synagogue of Satan are Samaritan Christians, the followers of Simon Magus. And put these Samaritan Christians, put the word Christians under quotation marks, of course. They had nothing to do with Christianity, just like their modern counterparts, brethren, have nothing to do with true Christianity. The phrase which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie, could easily be set off by brackets, for that is the way John intended it. He meant only one people, the Christian Samaritans. Now the, the Ephesus church era had a group they had to counter as well. Revelation chapter 2 verse 2. Revelation 2 verse 2 says, And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. Well, since the Bible is our guide in understanding this matter, brethren, the book of the books, the Bible shows us only one man who heretically sought an apostleship and never repented of his desire to have that office. It was Simon Magus. History shows us that Simon established his own Christianity, with his own apostles. So compare the statement about the Samaritans, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie, with which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. The only difference are the words Jews and apostles. But if we get to the point at which John is driving, he's saying that these people were calling themselves 
Jewish apostles, but that they were all liars. Oh, just like their modern counterparts claim that they're spiritual Jews and that they have replaced the house of Israel. They are Christians who have replaced the house of Israel, the ancient Israel. <laughs> they cannot be more deceived, brethren. And there again, the pagan counterpart, the pagan pendant to us, brethren. We are Israel. We are spirit-led Israel. And many of us, if not all of us, have some origin from the house of Israel. So you see, history is repeating itself, brethren. There are liars around who claim to be Christian Jews. You know, they are Jew Jews by, they are now spiritual Jews, which is a lie. They don't practice anything of true Christianity. And they are enemies of the truth. Meanwhile, we are the spirit-led Israel. We are the only legitimate Israel, spirit-led Israel, not them. They are liars. We do not lie. We have received the Holy Spirit of truth that guides us into all the truth. Reveals to us our even origin. Reveals to us who we are, that we are Israel, spirit-led Israel. Reveals that all the nations will have to be grafted into the Israel, the house of Israel, brethren. The very Apostle Paul writes that in Romans chapter 11. And obviously for a purpose, because, you know, those apostates, the Roman church, what did they do? Well, just was destroyed. Most of their members were destroyed during the persecution of that madman Nero. The pillars of the church were destroyed. What remained were just some newcomers who just basically apostated and created what was anciently the Roman Catholic Church. The followers of Simon Magus, brethren, came in and Masse, and they just, you know, filled the church to, to, to the fullness, and there it is. You have got the Simon Magus so called Christian Church. And even to this day, because Christ reveals to us what will happen in all church years, we have that false church, false Israel, false Jews. Meanwhile, we are spiritual Jews, as it is also explained in Romans chapter 2. We are spirit-led Israel, the legitimate house of Israel. We are, brethren. We have Israelites by after flesh, which are still unconverted, and we have us who are converted, spirit-led Israel. Isn't that amazing, brethren? Isn't that wonderful and amazing? And we do not lie. Unlike all those liars, the inheritors of the religion of Simon Magus, which was a blend of all sorts of uh, ideas from East, from the East, from Samaria, from ancient Babylon, but given the label Christian, and given the uh, the epithet, the uh, given the uh, the word holy, you know, there is nothing holy in what they are doing. They call it holy communion, holy this, holy that. All the things that are not holy, they've just branded them as holy. That's what it says that, you know, the Roman Empire, which was run basically by the Roman Church, had blasphemous names on its heads. And no wonder. And they've got, they've got these, 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 these uh, sacraments, which they call the, uh, the, 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 the hidden or the secret, the, the mysteries they call them. They have got mystery of marriage, mystery of uh, baptism, mystery of this, mystery of that. What sort of mystery is there in God's true word and His true church? Yes, we also practice, you know, marriage ceremony and we have baptism and uh, anointing. All the things that they claim they have. They call them mysteries. What is mysterious about that? Liars, brethren. They lie to be true Christians. They're not. They're just Neo-Babylonians today. They're just the followers of Simon Magus. Now, Simon Magus and his religion are connected with the old Babylonian idea also of the male and female religious principles. Simon had his cohort, Helen, alias Semiramis, and she figured very high in his system. In his message to the Thyatira era, to the Church of Thyatira, Christ underscores the female part of the false Christian system, which is described under the symbol of a woman, the woman Jezebel. 
Now this analogy was deliberately chosen for a reason, brethren, so obvious that John's first century readers could not help but comprehend what he was talking about, Jezebel. As you all know, woman in the Bible, not always, but often, is a symbol of the church. Now obviously it could be a symbol of the true church by her character, like for example would be a, a woman like Ruth, or it can be the false adulterous, spiritually adulterous, pagan church like this Jezebel. First, we notice that John says that this Jezebel called herself a prophetess in Revelation 2 and verse 20. The very name Vatican today uh, means, has something to do with prophecy, prophesying. You know, the, uh, so it's prophesying to the world. Prophetess. And there was indeed a particular false prophetess which had caused God's servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. This Jezebel, this Jezebel in, the, in Revelation, is equated with the female principle which Simon introduced into his Christianity. None other than Simon's Helen, the reclaimed temple prostitute from Tyre. What better type of person is there who could so expertly teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication literally as well as spiritually brethren literally as well as spiritually and this is the quote from the you know cause my uh, teachers to use my service to commit fornication it is quote from christ's words to Thyatira. the longest message and the longest church era is the church of Thyatira, the middle ages who was ruling the world brethren who was ruling europe in the middle ages who was persecuting god's people in the middle ages jezebel the woman a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church. Make no mistake, brethren. Make no mistake. And that Jezebel, of course, was seducing God's people, trying to make them to fall away from the truth, to commit fornication, spiritually as well as literally. Simon Magus came in, into contact with Helen and the Samaritans worshipped Sukkoth Benoth. One of those five deities. I am not going to go into the details about those. Those are interesting things. Yes, and hold me for my word. In the in the course of you know our studying and, 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 and Sabbath services, I will certainly return to some of those important things and facts that we as God's people must be aware of, brethren. But one of those five deities that the Samaritans worshipped was Sukkot Benoth. In fact, the those who were born in the city of Babylon and later were moved to Samaria and replaced the uh, ten tribes of Israel, they actually worshipped Sukkot Benoth, who was actually the goddess Venus. And you probably know what Venus is. The devotees, devotees of Venus continually prostituted themselves. It was their religious duty to do so. And this woman was persuaded by Simon's demonic power to follow him and to become the female principal, the necessary counterpart to his claim as being a type of male deity. Justin Martyr informs us that almost all the Samaritans and a few among the other nations acknowledge and adore him as the first god, and one Helen who went about with him at the time, who before had had her stand in a brothel, they say was the first thought that was brought into being by him. Well, brethren, again, Justin was himself a Samaritan, so he knew his people's native traditions and teachings. What he says agrees exactly with the New Testament revelation of how the Samaritans regarded Simon Magus. They called him the great power of God. We read in Acts chapter 8 verse 10, it is because of this that they believed him to have creative powers. He was the almighty God with creative powers, brethren. What a horrible blasphemy. Just like today in, the, in this successor church, the successors of Simon Magus and all the priests who succeed Simon Magus and his religions have this creative power to turn a wafer into the real body of Christ and the plain wine into the real blood of Christ, brethren. So they're magicians, you know, <laughs> just like their forefather Simon made, just like their founder was, brethren. Think about that. Use your common sense, brethren. Connect all this information with what you know 
what you see around yourself and then you will see exactly that it is the same system that is opposing the truth of God today in every single aspect of Christian, true Christian life. So Simon brought his female principal from the city of Tyre, the original Jezebel, the woman who seduced Israel to worship Baal, was the daughter of the king of the Sidonites, whose capital was the city of Tyre. You will read about that in 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 31. And not only that, but Helen claimed herself to be the creation of Simon. She was, in a sense, the daughter of Simon, but the original Jezebel was the little daughter of the king of Tyre. And the followers of Simon and Helen basically called them our Lord and our Lady. Lord and Lady. Which church, brethren, today has created a cult of Mary calling her Our Lady? And that Mary gave birth to our Lord. So usually on their icons you'll see, or their statues, you'll see Our Lady and Our Lord. Do we need more proof, brethren? Do we need to say more? Our Lord and Lady. I'm trying to remember how it is said in, uh, in Spanish, but only the Croatian words come to my mind, because Croatians are staunch Catholics, the greatest Catholics on the Balkan Peninsula. They call him Nash Gosp Gospodin i Nasha Gospa. Gospodin i Gospa, Lord and Lady. Now, there is also, brethren, another name related to the followers of Simon Magus that appears in the book of... There is another name that appears in the book of Revelation. Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans. But who were the Nicolaitans, brethren? What was that, what was that they did? What was it that they did? Well, in his let, later years, the Apostle Paul left the churches of God, which he had raised up in Asia Minor, under the general supervision of the Apostle Peter. But that's also interesting, and I will, again, if you see the second epistle of Peter, we can clearly see all those churches that were left and given over to Peter's care. Another time we'll talk about that. It's amazing how many interesting little details are there, brethren, for us to understand in a context. When we have the context, then we understand the book much better. So anyhow, you will see in Acts chapter 14, verse 26 and 28, that Paul left, among other cities, the city of Antioch in Syria under Peter's care. So it was the general supervision of Peter, again in his latter years. Keep in mind, we're talking about Asia Minor, we're talking about Eastern ancient city of Antioch. So, so Peter, the true Peter, was not in the West, but in the East. Or the false Peter, the false Simon Peter, the false Simon Mega, Simon Padre, Simon Father, was the, on the, in the West. So anyway, Catholic writers note that Peter watched over the Gentile converts from the ancient city of Antioch in Syria, as Antioch, next to Jerusalem, brethren, was the most important early center of the church, the true church, of course. And you'll find also in Acts chapter 11, verse 22, that Barnabas had been sent there to be its first minister. However, trouble soon arose. Eusebius Chronicle gives Peter the credit, the Apostle Peter the credit, for establishing this church in AD 42. Now mind you the time, AD 42, the middle of the first century. And then another account tells why Peter went there to withstand Simon Magus. Simon Magus was well and alive and active, brethren. So first, obviously, from Samaria, he went to Antioch of Syria, then later moved to Rome. Now, Jesus alluded to the situation which existed in Antioch at that time and elsewhere later in his message to the church of Ephesus. 
Revelation 2 and verse 15. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So Christ hated the deeds, the evil works of the Nicolaitans. Who were these heretics? Well, church fathers, Ignatius, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria and Eusebius, they all wrote of these Nicolaitans. From the Catholic Encyclopedia and from Hastings Dictionary of the Bible, articles Nicholas and Nicolaitans, we have the explanation, brethren. These Nicolaitans felt themselves free from any obligation to keep God's law, having, as Jude 4 says, turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, which means license to do what they pleased. And even to this day, all these nominal Christians, they can do what they please. And then perhaps, you know, when they see the death coming for them, then they can confess their sins, and their sins they'll be absolved, their sins will be forgiven, supposedly. Yeah. Forgiven by who? By those almighty Catholic and other priests who have power to, you know, forgive sins. We only know that Jesus Christ and His blood is able to forgive sins, brethren. No wonder that those blasphemous names are attached to the Roman system. It's blasphemy after blasphemy, calling unholy things holy, uh, you know, attaching giving the power to the priesthood the power that has only almighty god jesus christ in this case and his father and our father as well so some of those you know some of those nicolaitans carried this principle to its logical conclusion and they led lives of unrestrained indulgence they claimed to have derived from nicholas their doctrine of promiscuity nicholas so that's why they're nicolaitans who was nicholas now Brethren, it is not the deacon Nicholas, who is also mentioned in Acts chapter 6 and verse 5. Many have this wrong supposition. No, it's not the deacon Nicholas. This Nicholas of Antioch is identified with a bishop Nicholas of Samaria, a heretic in company with Simon Magus. So you have those two heretics, Nicholas of Samaria, and Simon Magus, they came to, into the Antioch in the middle of the first century and were causing troubles. But why was he called Nicholas of Antioch? Well, because, because brethren, he was with Simon at Antioch before the Apostle Peter came there to counteract their poison, their gall of bitterness. And perhaps those supposed accounts of the encounter of the Apostle Peter and Simon Magus in Rome most likely actually apply to their encounter in the middle of the first century in Antioch because Peter was obviously very successful at defeating Simon Magus and pushing backward or defending the local church at Antioch from Simon's Magus poisonous doctrines and influence. Now Antioch afterward became a secondary headquarters for God's church because it was equally accessible from Pontus, Babylon and Syria as well as from the Greek speaking areas of Southern and Western Asia Minor. And Antioch was the major Gentile center for the Feast of Tabernacles. <coughs> oh yes, the Feast of Tabernacles was kept in the, old, in the New Testament after Christ's death and is described in the Galatians chapter 2, verses 4, 12, 13, and 14. And then that was at the Feast of Tabernacles when Paul had that very great discussion with Peter and told him, You live like, you behave like the Gentiles. How do you expect the Gentiles to, you know, live properly? So Paul, Barnabas, and other leaders continued to work in Gentile lands from a headquarters in Antioch. That's Recorded in Acts chapter 13 and the first two verses of chapter 13. And even long after the apostolic days, brethren, Antioch remained a chief center of professing Christians. It became second only to Alexandria in Egypt in the false church and one of the five seats of patriarchs. Patriarchs are Greek fathers or papas. And it was one of those five seats in the state church later organized by the infamous, as far as I'm concerned, infamous Emperor Constantine the Great, whom I usually attach another word to him, Constantine the Great Pagan. 
because he was to the, to the end of his life worship of Mitra, which is another form of Nimrod, which is another form of Baal, the Phoenician god, sun god. You see, brethren, the sun worship is all the time present along with the history of the true church. And those sun worshippers are called Nicolaitans, Balamites, Jezebel, those who claim to be Jews by liars. Sun worship is all the time there, brethren. Even in today's, uh, in today's modern Catholic church, you've, you have the sun images in both Catholics and Orthodox churches. There's sun images there. You see them, well, you can just, you know, everything is now so accessible, so you can just type the altars or the, uh, uh, how would you call it, uh, the altars or the re uh, requisites or whatever related to the altar and what are the elements of the Catholic altar. You'll see, you'll see the sun the sun image there. Their wafer, which they their priests supposedly turn into the true and real body of Christ, is... In what shape, brethren? In the shape of the sun. Their tonsure, the way they shave their heads, is also in the shape of a circle, sun. All of those images they have on the on their icons and, and, and drawings, they've got this sun image above their heads. Circles, brethren, sun image. Sun worshipping all over the place. Last week you had Easter in the western, western part of the world. Today is so-called Great Saturday here in this Orthodox nation. Tomorrow will be the East, the East, or the East Orthodox, East Orthodox Easter. But they don't, they don't call it Easter. They call it the Resurrection. Just to illustrate to you to what depth you know the the deception goes into. Because in your language, in English at least, you have very clearly stated the pagan origin of that custom. Here in the East, there is nothing like that. It's called the resurrection. But it's all sun worshipping. It's the resurrection of the sun. Remember the Tammuz, Ezekiel chapter 8, one of those abominations that women who are supposed to be true worshippers of true God were weeping for Tammuz. Why were they weeping? Because Tammuz was dead, brethren. And then what a great joy! He rises up, you know, on Easter Sunday. Tammuz is resurrected and a great joy and celebration comes. What does that have to do with Jesus Christ and his religion? Nothing it has to do. Rabbits, eggs and stuff. It has nothing to do with the true religion and nothing to do with Christ and his apostles. Who are those people who are following those customs, brethren? Well, they're modern Samaritans. They're followers of Simon Magus whose very successor to this day is the one right there in the Vatican, the current Pope, like any other Pope before him. They're all the followers, the successors of Simon Magus. And now in Christ's message to the church at Pergamos, Nicolaitans are mentioned again among and along with those who hold the doctrine of Baha'u'llah, Revelation 2. Verse 14, 15, and 16. But I have a few things against you, Christ says, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Baalam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you have also those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, what was the doctrine of Baalam? We have just explained who were the Nicolaitans. Now let's explain the doctrine of Baalam, brethren. We find Baalam, and it's also very interesting, we'll go perhaps in some other details at another point, mentioned back in Numbers 22. The Hebrew, the name in Hebrew, Baalam, means conqueror of the people. Now it is the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek Nicholas, Greek Nicholas also means exactly that, conquer of the people. So both words, Baalam and Nicholas, denoted the office once held by Nimrod, who was Nimrod, conquer of the people, the first despot, the first dictator in the history of mankind, recorded in Genesis chapter 10, whose religion is well recorded in details in Alexander Hislop's book, 
the two Babylons. It's available to be downloaded even from the internet, brethren. Written a bit in, in archaic English language, but still very valuable source that we'll use certainly when we need to understand the paganism, modern paganism, under the cloak of Christianity. Actually, the paganism labeled Christianity. Or, as some commentators say, baptized heathenism. So, Balaam, Numbers 22, conqueror of the people, the same as Nicholas. So, both words describe the office once held by Nimrod, dictator and arch-rebel, who after the flood first established men's political and religious government based on false principles in opposition to the government of God. Well, just like their successor, Simon Magus, was in opposition to the government of God. To the government of the apostles, brethren. Just like Simon Magus' successors today, supposedly on the Holy See, another blasphemy, Holy See, can you imagine that? Are also people who are opposed to the government of God. So this Baalam was the greatest pagan prophet. He was the greatest religious figure of this of his time. He was the Pontifex Maximus of that day, the chief oracle of paganism. So now note that this man's headquarters, 1,500 years before Christ, was called in verse 5 in Numbers 22, Pethor, P-E-T-H-O-R, Pethor, which has similarity to Peter gods and Peter worship. And Peter, of course, in those ancient languages meant father. That's why you have this modern title of the modern Simon Magus, Holy Father. Now another blasphemy, brethren. Another horrible blasphemy. Now let the wise understand who today in the same kind of kind of office is headquartered in a place called St. Peter's. Now in Balaam's day, when the king of Moab was desperate because he feared the Israelites newly arrived out of Egypt, were about to take away his kingdom and dominion, there was no higher religious authority on earth to whom he could go. And that is why he sent all the way to Pethor in Mesopotamia, a place far to the north of his own country and near the border of modern Turkey. He completely passed up all his own priests, brethren, all his own priesthood, magicians and astrologers in his own nation. He went straight to the top, to the Pontifex Maximus. Now Balaam's doctrine was contrary to God's, and now when the emissaries of Balak, king of Moab, asked Balaam to curse Israel, Balaam asked God if he might be allowed to do that. Now you may wonder, why would a high pagan priest do that? Well, brethren, even Satan himself asked God's permission to bring a curse on a man under God's protection. Remember Job? And remember the story of Job. In chapter 1, verse 9 through 12, Satan asked permission to strike at Job. Now, Baalah wanted to go just as far in the way of evil as he dared, and that is Satan's way. However, God forced Baalah to bless Israelites instead of, instead of to curse them. And in any case, the Jewish rabbinical literature knows Simon Magus as the new Baalah. And indeed, Simon Magus inherited the office of Baalah, who inherited that office from Nimrod. Nimrod so was the founder of the ancient Babylon and all the ancient Babylonian religion. His office and his religion was succeeded by Baalam, Numbers 22, conqueror of the people. And then Simon Magus inherited the office from, ba from Baalam and he carried over that office over to the New Testament times. And his followers were named after one of his followers, Nicholas. Not the deacon Nicholas, but the Nicholas, a bishop of Samaria. Interesting, brethren. Amazing. When we understand all of these little facts, we understand the Bible much better. So the doctrine Baalam taught may be summarized as this. To take part in the political and religious affairs of the world and in their sacrifices, under quotation marks, sacrifices, at which physical fornication often occurred, to be a part of Satan's world and thereby commit spiritual fornication against Christ, the future husband of his bride, the church ecclesia. Without any going into any details, I'll just remind you in Revelation 13, brethren, the second beast 
has two horns, which are representative of its ecclesiastical and political power. And there is only one unique state, brethren, which is at the same time the Church. is the Vatican State. The two horns, religious and political power. Vatican State, which is, of course, being deeply involved in all the political and other affairs of the world. So that was the doctrine of Baha'u'llah. And his successor, Simon Magus, and his modern successors today. Two horns, brethren, written there for us in the Bible to remind us. Many people forget the Vatican is not only a church, a religion. Vatican is also a state. And therefore all of our countries have the ambassadors at the Vatican and vice versa. They have got their apostolic nuncius, apostolic emissaries also, in our countries. And that was exactly, you see, the teaching of some false teachers who had crept into the congregations of the true church in the Pergamos era. Now, there were also those brethren with the Pergamos church who held the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. And these same Nicolaitans appeared in the era of Ephesian church, as we have already said. Their doctrine, too, was one of no law, unrestrained indulgence, promiscuity, their doctrine and the doctrine of Baalam sprang from the same source. And no wonder when today you read about scandalous reports from that church founded by Simon Magus about sexual promiscuity, abuse of children, all sorts of horrible things. No wonder, brethren. That's their ancient doctrine. It's Neo-Babylonian now practices carried out into these New Testament times. But how did they differ, Nicolaitans, from the Baalamites? And why did Jesus Christ charge the church in Pergamos with harboring both? Well, brethren, the doctrine of Baalam was the original universally received Babylonian religion of Asia Minor, where the city of Pergamos was, as well as of the Tigris and Euphrates Valley and Armenia. So here was the home of the licentious worship of Bacchus and Venus. Bacchus I'm sure you know, is the Greek god of wine. And Venus, of course, or Venera, as she's called in, in Greek. And he, Serbian, Venera was the goddess of love. Read, goddess of fornication and sexual licentiousness and immorality. And the Pethor, the headquarters of Baalam, was right at its center, right at the center of this licentious worship of Bacchus and Venus. And here, during the succeeding centuries of Persian rule, Something of the Zoroastrian concept of eternal dualism, God versus evil, light versus darkness, had been engrafted just as it had been in Samaria. And that dualism, as you well know, we already established that in the sermon about Gnosticism, is well present in Gnosticism and is one of the main teachings of Gnosticism. The Gnostic Nicolaitans, when they came here, must have felt right at home. On the other hand, Nicolaitans represented a more specific religion, though an offshoot of the old, believing most of the same old pagan doctrines, practicing similar heathen rites or sacraments, and masquerading as Christian, using Christian-sounding names. Some of these had a definite doctrine of making sexual licentiousness a necessary rite of religion. They were the extremist wing of the Church of Simon Magus. So there was a specific question that I was asked, and we were all asked to cover, about who were the Nicolaitans. We have now provided much needed answer to that question about who they are and who they and their colleagues in, her in heretical teachings are. It all sprang from the same source, brethren. Simon Magus was successor of Baalam, who was successor of Nimrod of Babylon. So Simon Magus was successor of the Babylonian religion which was extant and present in Samaria, blended with some Old Testament teachings, and thus it became the false Old Testament religion. He later moved to Rome, now in the New Testament times, where he blended his Babylonian belief system with mostly terminology from New Testament and created a so-called Christian Universal Catholic Church. And even to this day, all of his successors are teaching the same, practicing the same, and nowadays doing the same 
in the form of ecumenism. Yes, those are the modern Nicolaitans and Balamites, the modern Samaritans, the modern followers of Simon Magus.